This video is the second in our series on troubleshooting performance issues in Windows Virtual Desktop. In this video, we're going to focus on the CPU and the various things that can cause CPU constraints to create bottlenecks and performance issues for users. My name is Vadim Vladimirsky, and if you are an MSP looking to build or grow your Azure practice with Windows Virtual Desktop, then this is the channel for you. CPU is really the most common source of slowness in a virtual desktop environment. Fortunately, it's also the easiest one to troubleshoot and the easiest one to identify as the root cause. All we need to use for CPU monitoring is a simple tool like the task manager or the resource monitor in Windows. Now, when we think about CPU, there is really two things to be aware of. Number one, there is the CPU capacity. How much capacity does a particular virtual machine have in terms of CPU resources? And then there is the CPU utilization or the demand on the CPU. And if you take the ratio of those two numbers, the amount of CPU that's demanded and the amount of CPU that's available, you get CPU usage. And it can vary anywhere from 0%, meaning that there is no demand on the CPU whatsoever, all the way to 100%, which means that the demand on the CPU is more than its current capacity, or at least equal to its current capacity. To identify a CPU-related performance problem, simply open up the task manager and go to either the performance tab or the details tab. Well, let's actually start on the performance tab. Here you can see the total CPU utilization of a particular virtual machine, which is acting as a WVD session host. If you're seeing the CPU consistently spiking to 100%, or if the utilization is consistently above 75 or 80%, then you're likely constrained by the CPU availability relative to how much demand is being placed on it. Now, CPU usage being high is not necessarily the root cause. It could actually be a symptom of something else. So it's important to be aware that when we're looking at CPU utilization, we have to consider things that could result in CPU utilization being high. For example, if you have memory constraint, if the system is exhausted for memory and there, there isn't enough free memory, then the operating system will start paging out data to disk, which will drive up not only disk utilization, but also CPU utilization. So you may notice a lot of CPU activity, but the constraint and the root cause of the problem may actually be memory exhaustion. If we do look on the performance tab of Task Manager and notice that CPU utilization is consistently high or is consistently spiking to 100%, that's a pretty good indication that the system is CPU constrained. Now, what you do with that information is really important because this could be normal behavior or this could be abnormal behavior. And the easiest way to see what's going on and what's actually driving that CPU utilization is done by going to the task manager and clicking on the details tab and then sorting all of the processes that are listed there in descending order by the CPU column. What that's gonna show you are the processes that are at the top of the list that are consuming most of that CPU. Sometimes it's also useful to add the CPU time column to this view because that's going to show you the processes that have consumed a lot of CPU over time since the virtual machine was booted up. So by going to the details tab and sorting by the CPU column, we can look at the top of the list. And if we notice processes that are consuming a lot of CPU at the top, that could be an indication that there is a problem with those processes, or it could be that the processes are being utilized or utilizing the system in a pretty normal way. There is no specific way to say generically that you know this should process should be at the top and that one should not. It just really depends on what your users are using on the system. So if you see some processes at the top that are abnormal, then depending on what they are, you can kill the process to lower CPU utilization, or you can investigate more as to why that process is consuming so much CPU resources. Each process is also listed under a specific user, so knowing which user session the process is running within can help you narrow down what the actual problem is. If the list of processes looks normal, and most processes are consuming a small amount of CPU, but there are just so many of them that the total consumption adds up to a high number, 
that could be an indication that the system is operating normally but it is oversubscribed meaning it has too many users or the users are placing too many demands on the CPU resources that are available in this particular VM. So what you can do is, is two things. You can either reduce the load on the VM or you can increase the capacity, the CPU capacity on the VM. To increase the capacity, you need to upsize the VM. So for example, if it's a four core or an eight core VM, then you can resize it up to an eight core or a 16 core VM that will double the CPU capacity available to the users and their workloads. Or what you can do is you can lower the utilization by each individual user or by all of the users in aggregate by spreading the users across more session host VMs, thus lowering the utilization on any one particular VM. This can be done with adding additional session hosts to the WVD host pool and then having the users log off and log back on to be load balanced across more VMs. In most scenarios, Windows Virtual Desktop session hosts are CPU bound. This means that you as an administrator will run out of CPU capacity on a particular VM as you start to load it up with users and applications before you'll run out of things like RAM or disk capacity. So the most popular VM instance families that can be used for WVD session host VMs are the D-Series, which is the generic compute uh, CPU uh, type of a VM where you get one CPU for, with, um, for every four gigs of RAM. So for every one CPU, there are four gigs of RAM in your VM instance. Or the E-series for those workloads that are more RAM hungry and need more RAM per core of CPU, in which case you get a one to eight ratio for each single CPU core, you get eight gigabytes of RAM. At Nerdio, we see hundreds of deployments of Windows Virtual Desktop. And here are the four most common mistakes that we see IT professionals make when deploying their production WVD environments. Number one, they often use burstable instances to run user workload in production. And this is really not a good idea because the burstable instances are CPU limited and CPU being the most common constraint as you can see, can create a problem. With burstable instances, when the VM first boots up, it doesn't have any CPU credits that are banked. Therefore, it is throttled down to some fractional availability of the total number of cores that you will actually see if you open up Task Manager. So our recommendation is to use burstable instances for testing, but not go live and not put any production users on burstable instances because those will experience CPU slowness. The second common issue that we run across is that a lot of applications when they install will place items in the all users startup folder under the start menu. What this results in is for each and every single user session that connects to a WVD session host, there is a set of startup items that start up for each and every user causing lots and lots of duplicate and redundant processes to be running in the background and consuming CPU unnecessarily. Each one of these may only be taking one or two CPU uh, percent, but if you add them up in, in aggregate across multiple users, it really slows the system down. In physical environments, this doesn't really matter because you have only a single user using a single machine. But when you try to consolidate many users on a single VM, this really comes into play and slows the system down. So it's important that after you've installed all of your applications, before you put the system into production, go into the C, Program Data, Microsoft Windows Startup folder in the Start menu and make sure that anything that's there is really needed. And for the most part, that folder should be empty. The third mistake we often see with WVD deployments is not completing the Windows updates on the template VM before it's captured as an image. If you run Windows update and then don't wait long enough after rebooting the machine for it to actually finish applying and capture that VM as an image and then deploy session host from that image, then those updates are being applied each and every time the image is deployed as a new session host. So that can be very CPU intensive and can consume almost all of the available CPU when the users are just logging into the system after it has been deployed from an image. 
So the best practice is power on the template VM, apply your Windows updates, and then wait for a while until you can see that the CPU utilization, especially of the TIWorker.exe process, has settled completely after a reboot of that machine. Only then you should shut it down and capture it as an image. And the final scenario that we often see as the cause of CPU-related slowness in WVD is streaming services. We often notice that users not knowing will launch YouTube or Spotify or Pandora and have a, a, you know, some music or video streaming in the background while they're working on the system. This not only consumes a lot of bandwidth, but it also uses a lot of CPU capacity to actually encode and transmit that media to the user's client device. So this is really easy to identify because if you open up the task manager and you look at uh, the details tab for each process that's running, you can see you know, which processes are consuming a lot of CPU and identify exactly what users are doing in terms of streaming services. And we recommend letting the users know, it's more of an educational item, letting them know that if they stream music and videos on their local device rather than within their virtual desktop session, not only will they have better user experience with the streaming service, but they will also have better user experience on the virtual desktop. Other users on the virtual desktop session host will have a good experience and you will also save quite a bit on bandwidth costs that are unnecessarily driven up by streaming services within the virtual session. These are some of the items that we often see with CPU-based performance issues. Hopefully you found this useful and I'm looking forward to talking to you about RAM-based or memory-based constraints in our next video. If you want to skip ahead and learn more about the other areas of performance contention, go ahead and click on the link below the video to view the full write-up.